गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन तो वॉम वेलकम फ्रॉम भारत सीरम एंड वैक्सीन फॉर आर टूडेज मीटिंग सो आई वुड लाइक टू इंट्रोड्यूस आर न्यू सीईओ मिस्टर आलोक खेतरी सो मिस्टर आलोक खेतरी हैज एन एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल फार्मास्यूटिकल बिजनेस सिंस लास्ट सर हैज मैनेज नेशनल एंड international pharmaceutical business since last 3 to 4 decades and sir has a uh, huge experience in building the organizations so with this short introduction i would like to hand over the session to mr alok khetri uh, thank you uh, doctor and prathamesh and uh, pleasure to meet all of you doctor so good evening doctors and uh, i take this opportunity to wish you uh, a very good evening uh today's session actually if i really look at first of all i joined this company recently and i was really impressed to look at the biotechnology portfolio of uh, bsv we are a leading biotechnology company and we are a leading women health company which is focused on patient centricity and uh, with regards to that i think it's a great uh, privilege for me today to talk about the introduction especially with regards to the art uh, act which it was launched and how as a company we want to really not only create awareness about it but also support the fertility centers you know with regards to the overall uh, i would say the implementation of the same and also certification wherever you know people are interested so just to give you an idea bsv group is very keenly involved with the academic collaboration with the doctors especially the gynecologists and um, especially with relate relate to the issues of women health and we are trying to see how we can really work more on the academic part collaborating with each one of you the second area is we are also working from a r&d perspective in innovative molecules especially in this segment and we have a very good programs program which is start your day you start your joy which is a social media uh, which is actually working on the social media platform where we are working with the doctors uh, across the country and trying to reach as many patients as possible especially in the segment of infertility and also information with regards to the art act how it is beneficial for everyone i think and more importantly the art act readiness program which we have partnered with bureau veritas which is a french based company and in this what happens is the assessment of the center takes place then also the suggestions how to really co get compliant overall and then finally a certification by bureau veritas to that center so this is actually something as a pilot we have already started and we would like to take it to more and more centers where the people are really interested and i think this will be another initiative from our side towards patient centricity so uh, uh, doctors you know in fact just wanted to say here that you know we are going to continue with our academic collaboration with each one of you we want to learn from you because in my 35 years of experience with pharma industry most of which has been with sanofi uh, i would say at the national and international level i think you know the important part is as bsv i am also seeing is that commitment towards patient centricity and patient education and cutting edge technology products which actually can provide a lot of benefit to the patients so we are going to be committed towards that and also towards academic collaboration like academic programs what you want to really do for doctors at large and also for patients so that's what i wanted to say uh, to start with so thank you very much and wish you all the best for the uh, meeting ahead thank you uh, thank you mr alok i now take pleasure in uh, introducing dr nayana patel madam is the medical director of akanksha hospital she is also considered as a pioneer in the field of ivf and surrogacy in india and uh, uh, she has got many accolades to her name she is also amongst the very few who has been invited at the opera winfrey show hard talk tedx talks and she has authored a number of articles and papers uh, worldwide across journals her research interests are regenerative medicine gut microbiome and many others dr naina patel madam the mic is yours
And uh, today is for organizing this webinar, which is the need of the hour, because it's a most well step in the field of ART, but also still it is taking baby, baby steps, so it's confusing. So we can clear a lot of uh, confusions that the practitioners have. I welcome my chairpersons, Dr. Nandita, unfortunately, who cannot come, Dr. Sujata Kar. So Nandita, we all know, is she doesn't need any introduction, president of ISAR and uh, president of MOGS, FOXI, MOGS, AIAG has been there all over and also member for the National Guidelines for Accreditations. We have Dr. Sujata Kar, who is the Honorary General Secretary of ISAR and the EC member of the number of societies with number of awards in Odessa, Parichai and Devi Award and Brand Icons Excellence Award with very many publications on PCOS and male infertility and has written chapters for books and newsletters, reviewers of many international general and recipient of seven gold medals in MBBS MD. And to her credit, she has the first baby of Eastern ESA, including first ESA, frozen embryo, and laser hatch babies of Orissa. So welcome, Sujata. And we now start the program with our first uh, speaker, that is uh, Dr. Sunil Shah. He is the president-elect of Ahmedabad Obstetric and Gynec Society and the state board member for ARD, joint secretary of Foxy 2021. He is his own IVF uh, center at Sarvamangal IVF Ahmedabad and has been past honorary secretary and treasurer of AOGS and a recipient of Gujarat Shreshti Award from the then chief minister and has authored many book chapters. So today he will be speaking on the ART Act, which is pertinent to the routine general obstetricians and gynecologists. So Dr. Sunil will speak on implications of the ART Act for general obstetrician and gynecologist. Sunil, you may start. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, I have to prepare these things in a very short time, but uh, I will try to uh, make more uh, useful to the uh, audience and delegates. And I also wish that, madam, you also join and put some uh, inputs being a clinician and we can understand what general gynecologists can face difficulties. And I also request uh, if Dr. Manish Bay also... Some problem? Sir, please go on. Okay, there was some disturbance. I don't know whether it was in my computer or everybody's computer. Uh, I have shared my screen. Uh, I hope uh, it is visible to everybody. Visible. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, as all of us know, that ART Act was made in year 2021 in December and then it has been gazetted and published and made a rule in year 2022. Uh, right. So, uh, basically, this salient, the salient features of ART Act are ART Act was classified into different entities by ART clinics, level 1 and level 2, ART banks and surrogacy clinic. And it was made mandatory to register all the gynecologists who want to work uh, as an ART specialist and they have to pay fees and they have to renew if they want to continue after five years. There are mandatory, they have made the staff mandatory with each specific qualification and they have defined functions and permission for enactment of the procedures. And a very important thing, they have made 
uh, offenses and punishments also for the uh, ART practitioners. So which all these things are make very special and difficulty for the general obstetricians and gynecologists to work. So the notification of the act was done in January 2022 and in the notification national and state boards were made. Rules and regulations are uh, been made after the amendments. They have also notified for the registry, uh, a national registry. Data has to be filled into the registry. Registration to be applied with the payment and within 16 days on the portal after the announcement of the state authority. These are the guidelines they have made. And around 5,000 ART clinic have applied for the registration and uh, ART clinic level two. Now the, it has changed and reached to around uh, 5,000. So ART bank around 1,300 people have applied. So already around 3,000 ART clinics has been approved and ART bank around 936 registration was received and in surrogacy around 754 applications was received. So amongst 1300 only 101 uh, ART bank has been registered so far. Uh, rest others, uh, the process is undergoing and in uh, surrogacy around 1000 surrogacy people, surrogacy clinic has been applied and amongst these 132 uh, uh, has been registered. Still no surrogacy clinic rejection has been done. So these are the inputs from the, uh, the site. So let us go ahead with the guidelines. And guidelines says this National ART and Surrogacy Board, State Board ART and Surrogacy Registry Authority, they have, as I said, that ART clinics, they have uh, divided into the level one and level two, ART banks and the surrogacy clinic. There shall be two levels of the clinics, namely level one, uh, ART clinics, where only gynecologist who wants to do a IUI procedure, they have to register for the level one clinic as a part of the treatment. Uh, for the level two, where the procedure or the case may be the techniques that attempt to obtain a pregnancy shall be carried out by any or all of the following, namely surgical retrieval of the gametes, handling of the oocyte outside the human body, use of the sperm for the fertilization of the oocyte and, and the transfer of the embryos into the reproductive system of the womb. It can be anything uterus or into the fallopian tube carry out storage of the gametes or embryos or perform any kind of the procedure or techniques involved in the gametes. So, and for the ART banks, so ART banks will be the responsible for screening, collection and registration of the semen donor and cryopreservation of the sperm. They can perform screening and registration of the oocyte donor and operate as semen banks or oocyte banks or both and they have to maintain the record or the data of all the donors and sell regularly update the national registry as provided in the sections 23, 27 and 28 of the act. So for the registration application for the registration shall be made by the ART clinics or any such health facility which are carrying out procedures related to the ART as defined in the act. And every application for the registration shall be accompanied with a fee of 50,000 for level one, two lakhs rupees for level two, 50,000 rupees for the ART bank and for surrogacy clinic, two lakh rupees. Even if you are uh, after application, if it is not registered, or not approved, then also these fees will not be uh, refunded. So, and they also uh, advise that these kind of the staff you should must appoint. So they have made it mandatory for level one, one ART clinic, there should be one minimum gynecologist is mandatory and the qualification of the gynecologist should be a postgraduate in gynecology and obstetrics. And there should be a minimum equipments of microscope, centrifuge and refrigerator. So these are the mandatory things for the level one. 
for the liver too, they have one gynecologist, one andrologist, embryologist, counselor, anesthetist, and director. So these are the staff requirement with specific qualification. So I will read out the qualification of the gynecologist and why? Because this, this is very important. The gynecologist will be a medical postgraduate. It will be a medical postgraduate in OBGY and should have a record of performing 50 ohm pickup procedure under supervision of the trained ART specialist with at least three years of working experience in an ART clinic under supervision. So in the case of the guy or in the case of the gynecologist already practicing ART or IVF and are working in the ART clinic before the commencement of this act, a postgraduate degree in gynecology and obstetric with three years of experience and record of 50 ohm pickup procedure shall be acceptable. Or the newer one, medical postgraduates, that means MD or MS, with super specialist doctorate of medicine or fellowship in reproductive medicine with experience of not less than three working years in an ARD clinic. So, uh, so if you calculate a person will do a MBBS that will take minimum five and a half years. If it, he or she is passing throughout, then post graduation of three years after NEET PG, right? They have to clear the NEET PG after MBBS. So without that also, that will take total of around nine years. And after that, three years of experience in the ART center under supervision and 50 OM pickup, that should be the minimum experience. So for the newcomers or the general obstetrician and gynecologist, they cannot start their own IVF clinic un un until they be Now for the general gynecologist, they will have to pay 50,000 rupees for the level one, uh, level one uh, registration. So, and most of the general OBGY, they are doing around two to four IUI per month, right? And those who are doing 20 IUI per month, they will definitely will start IVF. So most of the OBGY, when they are general obstetrician and gynecologists, they do around two to four IUI per month. So for them, these things are not feasible because they will have to uh, register. They have to keep all the data. They have to invest in a centrifuge, microscope, refrigerator, right? They cannot bring uh, the uh, already prepared samples from the outside. Now I have heard that those who were doing, they are doing some MOU with the IVF center or ARD bank, but looking to the ART law, they cannot do IUI unless they have registered for the level one clinic. So this has become very difficult for the obstetricians and gynecologists. So, and for say, level two, they need a uh, andrologist uh, and they should be MCH or DNB in urology. Now there is an amendment, even MS can do. Counselor should be a graduate in a psychology or clinical psychology or the medical life sciences, right? So these are the things which all uh, for the OBGY, they are making it difficult for the newer comer who wants to start a smaller clinic, smaller IVF clinic, doing five to 10 IVF cycles in a month for them to have a cycle, a, a counselor, uh, they have to have a MS and this kind of a, a infrastructure and making uh, these things are very difficult. So things are complicated for level two. They have, they should have a minimum equipments like microscope, incubator and incubator also too, because they want that there should be a backup incubator. Suppose one incubator is not working, another incubator is there. So the idea behind the act is good, but the general OBGY for them, it is really very tough because they have to invest and ongoing maintenance are very uh, difficult. Laminar airflow, sperm counting chamber, centrifuge, refrigerator, equipment for the cryopreservation, ovum aspiration pump. Uh, thank God they have not asked for the two ohm aspiration pump because 
sometimes it is also uh, in a centers like us we already have two aspiration pump that is needed usg machine with the amc test tube warmer and nsc resuscitation trolley these are the things they have made it uh, mandatory and uh, in art bank now no general obgy can store uh, or they can ask uh, may, i have seen uh, previously that many gynecologists have that uh, liquid nitrogen tank and they used to keep in a periphery uh, they used to keep a liquid nitrogen tank and they used to have uh, around 5 or 10 samples of the donor and they used to have a uh, many uh, husband they are into the military or staying outside they used to keep uh, their sperms uh, into this uh, liquid nitrogen uh, tank and they were doing but nowadays with the law it has become very difficult so and in level 2 they also have asked to have a grievance redressal uh, desk that is also one thing which is difficult so uh, all these things are making a uh, practice of art little complicated and uh, one of the uh, rti was done and in rti someone has asked uh, that can can i uh, use uh, gonad droppings in a uh, non registered level 1 clinic so in ard they have in rti they have specially said that no you cannot uh, uh, do this thing so uh, these are the very difficult uh, things and about offenses and penalties so i will speak that uh, abandoning or exploiting children born through art are the offenses selling purchasing trading or importing human embryos or gametes exploiting the commissioning couple no definition of exploiting suppose some problem happens in the charges also then couple can uh, argue and can complain that uh, they have said uh, if they don't get result they can say that uh, i have been exploited or something like that so these are the things which are uh, complicated we have to quarrel with the patient we have to counsel much uh, so that exploiting the commissioning couple woman or the gamete donor in any form and these offenses will be punishable with a fine between 5 and 10 lakh rupees for the first contravention and for subsequent contraventions these offenses will be punishable with imprisonment between 3 and 8 years and a five fine between 10 and 20 lakh rupees a court will take cognizance of an offense only on a complaint by the national or state board uh, thank you thank you very much while we have uh, uh, dr naina madam coming back may i take the honor to introduce dr manish banker sir sir is the director of banka ivf and women's hospital he has been awarded the prestigious dr bc roy award by medical council of india he is also the past president of isar regional representative international committee for monitoring art senior editor and uh, board of directors of the poseidon group he is also a member surveillance editorial board he's been there on the board and served them for a couple of years member board of directors pacific rim society of reproductive medicine and uh, he's also been a founder board of aspire welcome sir welcome to the art act webinar we have dr naina patel madam back so i will hand the mic back to dr naina patel uh thank you and sorry for the little inconvenience uh, so i will start my presentation today the topic is art act opportunities and difficulties so first of all i would like to thank uh, bsv for organizing this and i regret the inconvenience that has been caused to due to the technical issues and such an inconvenience we are now seeing when we are implementing the art act so we know now as dr sunil mentioned that the art act has been implemented 
are signed on 25th January. There were some changes in the regulation which we came up on 7 June 2022, mainly regarding the donor egg. And then again, some regulations which added up in 2023 July. Now this act is mainly to regulate and supervise the ART clinics, the ART banks, and to specify rules and regulations for various procedures related to ART. So it's not only the act, but there is they've explained to you the indications, how to do it, when to do it, how many numbers of embryos you can implant, to the extent that what will be the age, what Teasing these medical concerns so the research purposes. So the key points are all the ART services, registrations of the clinics and banks, formation of the National State Board, the eligibility criteria for a couple who comes or a single person who comes for IVF or ART, eligibility criteria for the donors and the conditions for offering services, rights of a child born through ART, duties of the ART clinics and banks, offenses and penalties. So first, let, let us look at the opportunities. And now I feel that it's a huge opportunity because it has become an organized sector. Like people coming abroad, or if you meet them outside in conference, they had a feeling that you can do everything. But now with the act, we can say we are at par with the other countries where there is an act, where there is a law regulating this practice, and we cannot do anything or everything in India. The second important thing is the counseling part because previously a couple may not be aware of what was the treatment, how many eggs, embryos, or what would be the outcome. They always came with the hope it will be 100% success. But introduce a must counselor has become very for everyone involved. And then the discharge summary. We knew that when we started or even few years back or even now, there was no discharge summary. A patient will come that had three IVF cycle. Patient has no reports what injections, what embryos, grade of the embryos, nothing. So now with this discharge summary, it becomes very organized that the patient and the doctor to whom they go again knows exactly what was done, what was used, and how differently we can treat the patient to maximize the outcome. Third, the payment summary is also very important. And finally, the outcomes. So the act is most welcomed and has given an opportunity to India and to all of us by making it an organized sector. The second most important, I think we have huge data of the IVF cycles and the number going on, but there is no data registry. Dr. Manish had started the NARI for the ISAR, but unfortunately it was not mandatory. So many clinics would voluntarily give the data, many will not. And ultimately with India having huge data, we cannot come okay, this is the outcomes, what do, how many patients and if, but so many registries in the world from SART and uh, the HFEA, the, the Europe and the uh, Australian registry, then India can become a part of it once this registration and information becomes a must. The third is the quality of the ART will improve. Why? Because they have written specifically what will be the infrastructure. You just cannot start in a small room or a huge building, but there is nothing inside. The infrastructure, the flow of infrastructure is beautifully defined. The human resources, right from class, the uh, attendant class, to the doctors, to the embryologist, andrologist, everything has been defined. So now we know that any patient entering a clinic will know that they have a doctor, they have an embryologist who has been inspected by the ART board, the state board, the national board, and then they know that the person to them or the clinic to whom they are going, the knowledge and skill is perfect as per the act. 
Most importantly is the legal safety. Because once the act is in place, it is a double-edged sword. But at least now we know that some couple come blaming that why it failed, it was your mistake, refund the money. We know that we have counseled properly, we have taken the permissions. It can fail, it can miscarry. The staff and the couple and the clinics and the clinicians all are legally protected because now we are going to act as per the law and the law is there as it is punishing you, it is also there to protect you. But the difficulties are humongous. First of all, there will be registrations and there will be state boards and the national board. National board functional state boards now, it is the prerogative of all the states. So, in some states, the boards are very well formed, functioning. Some states, they are formed but not functioning. And some states don't even know what's happening to the state boards. And that is the reason the whole country is not at par. While each state, each district is, as a, as a, is at a different level. Because first, people didn't know a smaller district where there are few centers would get the done, things done immediately. A huge district like Ahmedabad will take a longer time. And the doctors don't know where to pay for the registration fee, how to pay, once it is done, when they will come for inspection. So these are the teething problems. And I know that any new act, when it comes into place, like the GST, it took one and a half years to start functioning properly. And this is the same that's happening now. So... These are teething problems are one concern. And the other concern is that everybody, each appropriate authority can interpret the law as they want. Just the other day, because I'm a member of the state board, I get a call from one of the clinics that, doctor, we everything inspection went off well, but they said you need two gynecologists and two embryologists. But the re latest uh, regulation that has come up says that one gynecologist and one embryologist is all you need. What do we do now? So I put this question on the state board forum that we have. And immediately I got an answer. Finally, the thing was solved and everything is fine. So such simple problems also come up at the time of inspection. There was another query that they are asking for the MTP Act, but my clinic is only IVF. I don't have even heartbeat stem. So why do I need MTP Act, MTP, uh, the license, the act that we have to take the permission? It is not registered to mandate, it is not mandatory to register under the MTP Act. So that clinic, the appropriate authority was informed. For MTP. But if the clinic is pure, if no MTPs are undertaken, it is not mandatory to register under the MTP Act. So these small issues come up. Now, who can avail ART services? That has also been specifically. But most importantly for us, it is to check over age and the upper age of the couple. We are very indulgent in looking at the age of the couple unless they were very old. But if the couple is 50, ethically we would stop or if still insist we would go for the physician's opinion etc. But now as the act has said the upper limit of the female is 50 and upper limit of the male is 55. More importantly is the lower age because we know the marriageable age is 18. And by the time female is two years not pregnant, they'll start coming for IUI, IVF. Or if the male has a severe male factor, like hardly any count, they would want an IVF done, ICSI done earlier because they've been married for two years. But we, we cannot do at 20 years any IVF procedure. So Aadhaar card and looking at the age, not only at the reception, but as a doctor before we start, these documents should be checked by our person. Because I recently had a patient who had taken five days of injections for IVF and suddenly it came to the notice of the clinic that she's not 21 complete. She stopped and she came to us that, will you continue? We said, no, we will not continue. As per the act, you cannot do it. So these are little problems that 
and but a major problem we all should look into that upper age limit and lower age limit should be checked and doubly confirmed by Aadhaar card or school certificate, living certificate. Now, this is a tricky situation that has come up. The embryos created when the husband was 55, nearing 54, nearing 55 completion. Wife was 37 and the first cycle was unsuccessful. We know at 37 wife's eggs it could be. Now the husband is 55 complete and the embryos are with us. Can we transfer? So is that the age at the time of registration and starting the cycle of the IVF? Or it can continue till the embryos get exhausted. So this upper age limit of the husband especially. Wife, we know at 50, she is not going to give eggs. It's only the donor egg embryos that will be created. But that is also an issue I faced in one patient recently. Here, it should be specified that supposing husband is 54 years and 10 months and we have created embryos with his wife 37 years old. First cycle failed. He is now 55 complete. Can we transfer those embryos? That is an answer which we all need. Similarly, it happened for my patient who was 49 at the time of starting the donor egg cycle with the uh, husband's sperm. And she was completing 50 years on 5th of September. We were lucky that we got a positive result on 29th August and she's continuing with pregnancy. But what if that had failed? What will we do with those embryos? It is at the time of registration and starting the cycle, which say you can finish it off in six months or one year or not beyond that. Or as soon as they cross 55, even if we have embryos, we cannot transfer. So this thing also needs to be addressed. Single women, married heterosexual couples and even foreigners, but with all proper uh, FRRO forms, signatures, OCI, our Indians coming just on medical uh, tourist visa can be converted to medical visa, but live-in couples are not allowed. So female partner, how they can do? So now the people are finding their way out if it's a live-in. They will come as a single parent. The donor egg is, donor sperm is allowed from the anyone you know. And so they bring in the live-in partner as donor sperm, but the birth certificate will be as a single mother. And she loses all her rights as a life living partner. So living couple India has got rights to right to property, right to alimony, protection against domestic violence. But unfortunately, the children born in this, naturally, they will have been entitled to share the inherited property. But through IVF, because livings are not allowed, that child will be deprived of getting the father's name and of getting the inherited property. And that woman will not be protected against the domestic violence or will not be getting any right to property. Now, egg donation. Very good. We know we, we all know that there were egg donors who went on donating eggs. The consanguinity would be increasing. The egg donors' own health will be jeopardized by doing that. So bringing in was egg donation under the act was very good. But one time egg donation, I think, is very difficult because we have shortage of egg donors and three times would have been ideal. But the most important thing is the Aadhaar card. And they come with the Aadhaar card. They come with the uh, insurance and affidavit. But we know that there are a single woman coming with two Aadhaar cards or differently, I don't know. Who will be responsible that because at the time of retrieval, we come to know that, okay, she has donated elsewhere. What to do? So that is becoming a big issue. Is the clinic responsible? Is the agency responsible? That is the, I would not call it agency, but the ART bank. So these issues are becoming difficult and we have to be very, very vigilant about this. And the age of the egg donor is also important. We should always notify that. The sperm donation becomes even costlier. Previously, IUID was easier, but now it becomes a very costly affair. Sometimes the patient is counseled that it's better you go for IVF because your one-time sperm donation can cost you 30,000 rupees also. So if it's two, three times IUI donor sperm, it becomes a very costly affair. The same sperm donor can give up to three samples that is allowed, but again, if that doesn't work, it becomes... And again, the same donor with the different Aadhaar card is becoming difficult. Known donor. It's very good that they're allowed known donors for the eggs especially because 
very difficult to find egg donors and maybe the genetic material they want and that girl is being pressurized from the in-laws that we do not want an outside egg donor. So that is okay, the family members come. But sperm donation has become a bigger issue and a social issue because most of the time it's the brother, elder brother or the younger brother who would come or sister-in-law's husband who would come to donate. And it becomes a very, I think, a little difficult situation for that girl undergoing IUI or IVF. We can sense that, but as it is allowed, because we know in the consent form, there is nowhere written that the spouse's consent is needed. So a sperm donor and the egg donor can give without the spouse's consent, only thing they need to be informed. Frozen gametes and embryos. If you see here, it is written that if you don't want you, you can discard it, give it for research purpose. And the husband writes that I'll hand it over to my wife. If I die, wife writes over. But what if divorce happens? And I'm facing this situation. A couple had a baby in December 22. Both husband and wife have filed for divorce. They are in the UK. Embryos were created by donor eggs. Now both of them are fighting for the custody of the embryos. And actually... We are not anybody to decide. The consent form has not got anything written. If they divorce, who will get it? So the best situation right now is we have asked them to go to the court, fight it out and come to us. Frozen embryos cannot be donated. So couple conceive with IVF at their extra embryos. Now, the sister and brother-in-law have the same issues and they decided that we will use their frozen embryos for us because they need donor egg as well as donor sperms. But the frozen embryos cannot be donated and cannot be transferred in this couple who is the sister and the brother-in-law. So that are getting discarded and already new embryos have been frozen. So that will be transferred in this couple. So these issues also need to be looked into it and transportation of embryos has become little cumbersome, I would say, for all the couples. The couple sometimes has to migrate to another city or they are not comfortable doing in the same clinic and would want it in another clinic. There are many reasons why they want to shift their embryos and they are the owner of those embryos. So instead of getting the permission from national board because they have to file an affidavit, the opposite clinic has to give an affidavit and they have to give all the details. But instead of national board, it is at the appropriate authority level, which meets every month. The job for the couple, for the clinic, everything becomes easier. So this particular transportation of embryos and getting permission from national board is time consuming as well as little difficult. So if appropriate authorities can give it, it would be really good. And documentations, huge amount. You need two persons. Online, when it will start, you will need the third person because see the number of forms up to 15 which has to be properly filled up and then properly submitted and submitted before 5th of every month. So a mistake in documentation and how the appropriate authority interprets is, is the thing that will decide your penalties like it's happening in the PCP and DT. So the act itself in the preamble says that the act is made for prevention of misuse, safe and ethical practice of ART, for addressing the issues of reproductive health where it is required. So the preamble is made in such a way that yes, everything unethical, unsafe was going on, it was misused. So now we will clamp you under act. So that makes it like a criminal act. And showing that the clinics, the doctors, the banks are going to be under tight scrutiny, assuming that there is something unethical happening. And the culprit could be just a single mistake in a documentation. And the hierarchy of the boards, appropriate authority, state board, national board, national registry. So there's so much of official governance which can lead to red tapism. And grievance cell, as Dr. Sunil has said, every clinic, every blank shall maintain it. Though in an ABH, we maintain it routinely, but that is one extra facility that each clinic needs to provide. And the punishment already mentioned by Sunil, really very harsh. It can be under PCP and DTAC. It could be under contraventions. And compared to other countries, our punishments are really hard. So to conclude, I will say that with, with the implementation of the act, this has become an organized sector improving the quality of treatment with legal protection to all stakeholders and giving India an opportunity for the national registry. But... 
Injustice to couple who cannot conceive based on age and marital status, which we need to look into. Burden of documentations, registrations, inspection, and fees. Making a comparison for the clinicians as well as the couples. Making treatment more expensive and less accessible, especially the donation, egg donation program. And social implications when it comes to donor-created, non-donor-created programs. Punishment of law as clinical clinicians, banks, and patients vulnerable. Laws are well, but they need to be precise of to all the and there are many points, as I mentioned in my presentations, that are not clear and clarity is needed on that. Thank you once again. And I invite whoever is listening to the SR Embryology 2023, 3, 4, 5 November, this weekend in Ahmedabad. Thank you. So with this, we go to the question answer session. And I invite Dr. Manish Banker and Advocate Radha and now I introduce Radhika Thapar. She is a practicing lawyer and specializing in the field of medical legal issues with one of the main areas of focus in assisted reproductive technology. She is the chief mentor in law care. Legal for assisting doctors, patients, subjects, ART, and donors, and advisor to ESR for and has got Champions Trophy and President's Award for ESR Conference. So, welcome uh, Radhika and welcome Dr. Manish. Thank you, ma'am. I think so my first question goes to Dr. Manish. Can gynecologists do stimulation without registering for ART level 1 or level 2 clinic? Dr. Manish? Has he joined? Radhika, you can start answering that and Manish can join. Yes, ma'am. So ma'am, any stimulation, anything that has to be done, at least a minimum of, to what our understanding is a minimum of ART level 1 uh, uh, is required because of the very definition of the act, which is, uh, which I, if you allow, I may want to read it out. It's basically uh, assisted reproductive technology with its grammatical variations and cognitive expressions means all techniques that attempt to obtain pregnancy by handling the sperm or oocyte outside the body, human body and transferring the gamete or the embryo into the reproductive system. So when they use the all techniques here, the officers are interpreting that from the very beginning, if somebody is doing this practice, they better get, you know, a minimum of ART level one. What do you say, Dr. Manish, you are there? Yes, please. Yeah. So the same question, can gynecologists do stimulation without registering for ART level one or two? I am not very sure. I have heard conflicting views on this from people. So I really am not sure. I think even in the RTIs, there have been contradictory answers. So I really, I honestly don't know whether a gynecologist can do stimulations for an IVF cycle or not. For general ovulation induction, yes. But for IVF, I am not very sure. Yeah, because nowadays, previously, you also know, Dr. Manish, if you had a friend in Nadia, you can tell that, okay, this is the stimulation protocol. You send me the scan reports and send patient directly for egg retrieval. That was happening quite often. Are yes. we still entitled to do that? With I legally? think so long as the patient has been counseled first at an ART level 2 clinic, the protocol has been decided, consents have been taken, then someone else can administer the injections on your behalf. That should not be a problem. But I don't think a non-registered doctor can... Uh, I mean, himself or herself, do the counseling and start the stimulation and send the patient directly for pickup. This is something, whether it is allowed or not, I am not very sure. So, once again, we need clarity on that. Dr. Sunil, you have any idea on that? Uh, 
my input is like that see basically it depends upon the authority at that particular moment how he or she is interpreting the law right and your advocate how he or she is representing yourself to the judges because it's a little bit of gray area and the definition is a handling of the gametes outside the body whereas giving injection is not a handling it is just a, a medicine so it's definitely a gray gray area okay manish then we come to a more important point like most of the gynecologists are using ovulation induction drugs so far for inducing ovulation but what about when it, there is usage of gonadotropins they do stimulate gonadotropins for timed intercourse also so such a gynecologist who runs a gynec clinic but does ovulation induction either with ovulogens with gonadotropins for timed intercourse do they need a level 1 registration i don't think so i think level 1 registration is only for those who are going to handle gametes either for iui or for ivf if you are not going to do either of these two procedures i don't think there is any objection in them doing any kind of ovulation induction okay yes ma'am uh, ma yes uh, i agree with dr banker and uh, uh, again taking it from here i would like to answer the previous query also uh, see if we are doing so how we are interpreting it it is basically those um, all techniques that we are using to handle it outside so in this particular case the query number 2 that you have asked in that that's not going to happen so probably for that we are not uh, wanting any art level 1 uh, requirement for them but if we are putting a, a patient to such kind of treatment which comes under this art app then certainly to my understanding they should take it because again as um, it has been said that it is the interpretation of the lawyers the authorities and eventually in the court so any case which goes in the court related to these acts then the interpretation will go very far and the uh, standard of care would start from the very beginning point you know the doctor who did the stimulation till the end of the process so i would request in that particular case an extra caution be taken and uh, registration under art uh, level 1 should be done okay so if you are planning iui dr manish and some of your peripheral uh, friends refer you for iui dr manish i think i mean so i think the same thing happens i think if, if, if whether it is iui or you whether it is referring iui how will you establish the practice no so if whether it is iui or ivf if the primary counseling and consent has been done at an appropriate level 1 or level 2 clinic there should not be any problem so all the patient needs is one visit before the stimulation is started and consents are taken then i don't think there is any problem but do you need a proper mou like one of your friends says i don't want to do iui but i'll send my patients at the oh, right it is place. okay no see whether i see it is like MOU, because... mou is not good see i see a patient i i prescribe iui medication she goes to a doctor x buys the medication from there does the stimulation there i don't think there is anything against it that patient is following my instructions many patients buy drugs from a pharmacy and have the injections taken even with a general practitioner or with a nurse do we have an mou with a nurse or a general practitioner no so the taking injections anywhere does not require any mou but having said that if you because there is no provision for any such mou you know what will you write in an mou absolutely uh, i mean no... you, you cannot have an mou that even though you are not registered as per this mou we are allowing you, allowing you to do stimulation you cannot go against no center is right to authorize any other doctor see mou can be had to have a financial contract or arrangement but for legal arrangement i don't think the mou stands ma'am can i have the question again supposing i have a friend she doesn't do iui she says i'll see my patient i'll stimulate her for iui and at the time of iui i'll send to your clinic so she is doing everything at the clinic she has decided that she wants to do iui she has stimulated her and today she comes for iui to me 
do i need to have an memorandum of understanding with that uh, practitioner who is doing it and sending it to me no that's not required that's not required see basically as long as what you are doing and you have your all your licenses and regulations for that particular uh, uh purpose like level 1 or level 2 in place that's okay from where the patient is coming whether that patient that center was registered or not registered your friend or any unknown center that's not uh, required you are in taking now that lady supposing your friend does not have a level 1 uh, registration right yeah that she doesn't do that yeah That's okay. Patient. You in the patient care. You know, she, the patient is stimulated. Now the patient wants to do an IUI. I mean, that's okay. No need for an MOU or nothing like that. You can take in the name of the patient care. You can take the patient and do the relevant procedure. That's not a problem. At the back end, if she is faulting on something, she is accountable for that. You are not accountable for that. But supposing supposing this patient develops severe OHSS or as a quadruplet pregnancy and takes the yes. doctor to court. I mean, as an ART clinic, are you responsible because you had not counselled the patient and given appropriate care? So, what happens in that particular case, Doctor Banker? From where the patient is coming, of course, the patient is going to tell you the history. So, please ensure that you write that brief history on that case, and you are doing your dues which are required under the Act. You see what all the patient has been given. You ask for all the prescriptions the patient has been given. If you have any contradictory view that this patient was not administered well, or you are unaware what the patient was given, then you please do all your examinations or whatever your protocol suggests, and then take it forward. Yeah, and so, you must so make a brief analysis of the same. Yeah. So, so, so essentially, the responsibilities of the clinic or the doctor who does the IUI. Yes, who does the IUI, but they have to now. You can't ignore the patient. Patient somehow landed in a clinic which was not licensed, took a bit of treatment for any reason, good or bad reason, shifted from there to you. So you please make a note because that will become a part of it. And tomorrow, if the file is called in the court, you will be on the safer side because you've taken the history well and you put it on record that this is how I got the case, and from here onwards, I'm taking it up. and if you have to suggest anything to the patient giving any recommendation to the patient look i don't know what you've been given what the proper prescription is not with the bill you can put a note on your file regarding but the unregistered unregistered doctor can stimulate the, uh, the uh, patient right with gonorrhea mm -hmm. dropping what yes. what can you what can we do if somebody is doing that kind of practices you are not accountable no, no, we cannot stop account. that the question is stop. no the question is let's say if you are doing this for one particular doctor many times and there is a complication once and the court establishes that you have been doing 25 such patients every month for that particular doctor then you cannot claim ignorance no ki ye to ek hi patient tha aise hi aa gaya if there are 20 patients some month it means you are having an arrangement of someone doing it and you are regularly doing it uh yes that can be drawn as an inference right that this is somewhere you are taking but if all the more if you sign an mou with that person all the more you are in connivance with that person if that no, person no, I, is not I registered right? no no i agree signing an mou does not protect you but the bigger question is should we even i, I mean yes, are you to do this or not are we allowed to do no you may be doing 100 things then you can say that why are the authorities sitting in the uh, state like that i am not the authority i have patient walking down from this particular center who is doing 100 have come to me might be doing 1000 oh. patients in the clinic no, so no, it's no, the authority Radhi, has to respond radhika the question another question is that see basically we are also talking for our general obgyi friends also just yes. now right so not for me or for manish bhai or naina of course of course of course so i know we... that is some more hitch i say that if that particular doctor says that i'll come and do the egg retrieval and embryo transfer or iui at her place then we definitely need to enroll that particular gynec in our own yes. clinic as yes. an extra gynecologist yes correct yes if they are coming at your center they are doing it you have to enroll if they are supposedly somebody says okay i have done a little bit procedure now they don't want to do it they refer you go to dr nana they are referring then we tomorrow, don't need tomorrow it. okay tomorrow there will be a case which has come up out blown out of proportion 50 cases partially done here then done here they might look into their records your records they might look into your financial transactions but if they are unable to prove of any exchange of money or anything that you are asking them to do 
you know and just to do without our license then only you are responsible otherwise okay. what you are so doing we can doing assure doing our friends that they can do it the yes. next important thing is that the iui with the routine gynex used to do it still they have applied for iui licenses then they used to get the samples prepared from the pathology labs so dr manish can a pathology lab process semen sample and send to gynecologist at art clinic one for insemination or it has to be an in house preparation at the clinic no sample can be moved without the approval of the national board whether it is for an iui or iva whether it is for sperms eggs or embryos so processing at one place and moving at another place can only happen if you have a case based approval for that particular case so the sample processing and the insemination wherever it happens that place needs to be registered as a level 1 clinic and the person who does this also has to be on that level 1 clinic supposing a pathology lab agrees that i will prepare the sample then he should have an iui registration and an iui facility to do the intra uterine insemination in the same premises yes, so the pathology lab has to be registered as a level 1 clinic then the gynec then, can go there the husband can go give the sample the gynecology the should be registered madam there. no the pathology lab a gynec should be registered there yes who will go and do the procedure so this is also one query that you have got that if the pathologist has a big lab can they have this so that can be done now a couple comes or a woman comes with a relative who wants to donate the semen sample for them what is the procedure and uh, what concerns are to be taken okay. this is like any other semen donation they will have to first go through the art bank the art bank will check the the other card whether he has donated earlier or not because it has to be again for one couple only the semen the consents are taken blood test done sample collected and then it can be sent to the ivf clinic for that particular couple so whether it is anonymous donation or known donation the process that needs to be followed is the same is the same and the consent form only says that the spouse should be from no need for spouse consent only one question i have i think this is not terrified can a father donate semen for his son i don't think there is any prohibition to this in the law yes yeah. the age age barrier is there that is fine so long as the father is below 55 i don't think the law prevents a father from donating semen for yeah, his son you have to see other uh, medical issues uh, apart from that there is no such bar another thing dr anena i would like to mention here when we are talking especially about the known donation right there is though there is nothing um, uh, prescribed as such in the law but i always suggest to have a, a sort of agreement between uh, the donor known donor and uh, the recipient uh, uh, so that you know there are other interests later on when the child is there uh, there is no ambiguity or there is no confusion because inheritance issues could be there there could be other uh, attachment issues which may result so it is always important apart from the consent that there is some sort of uh, you know document be drawn between the parties and when we are talking about the art bank i would suggest that you know i've seen a practice where people are signing mous with the art bank that the clinic has signed one mou with the art bank who is the supplier of donor gametes or sperms i would suggest that in every case take an affidavit from the art bank that they have screened there are parameters which are required for which they have to test a uh, you know a donor on those parameters Uh, their doctor should sign those reports there should be an affidavit from the uh, art bank also so that's a good point in a way but i think it will be still very difficult and tricky to get an affidavit for each donor for from the art bank that this has been done as per the rules ma'am so we are doing it it's it's been happening our clinic our centers who are taking legal services for us for every case we are taking from them because we are at the moment uh, that stage hasn't come where one donor is given to one center how to testify it so one it helps to purpose because we put a clause in that that i will not be supplying this donor to anybody else and then there are clauses relevant to what is the requirement of the act to where the accountability of the donor bank is there tomorrow the donor is sending mr and miss x to you and then tomorrow saying i have not supplied it you know for any particular reason so we are taking them on we are binding them on oath 
what do you say, Dr. Sunil and Dr. Manisha? I don't know because we are not taking any such affidavits from the ART bank for this. Uh, we have already done an MOU with the bank, right? Now it is their responsibility, right? Whenever they send a letter to us, then we put it into the file. So it becomes the responsibility of the ART bank to prove, right? We, we have taken uh, this form from them, right? Now on their letter, the, all the data, screening of the data and everything has come. So I think that is their bank responsibility. And about uh, that uh, consent of a known donor, Right. It is, I agree with that because it's a, like a precaution sitting in a car and wearing a helmet. Okay. Known adoption. Some yeah. relative sister, yeah. son or daughter has been taken Perfect. and take a, a affidavit that no, because they are the known donor. After four or five years, somebody will say that this is my son or my daughter. So that's a good yes. thing. And, 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 you know, uh, if it is more tricky, then somebody can say she was the surrogate for me. You know, or she, the other party who was doing the baby for me. I was not the donor. She was other way around and the clinic was involved in other malpractice. So it can take different shapes. So it's always important to get one document uh, which sorts out all. Because at the end of the day, child is not a commodity. We have to see something, you know, for the welfare of the child. What do you say, Dr. Manish, regarding the donor program? So we have an MOU signed which mentions the duties and responsibilities. Now to take a letter with every donor is an added precaution. I mean, it is like we are asking the bank to give in writing with every donor that we have followed the terms of the MOU. I mean, it's an added precaution. If you take it, there is nothing against it. Okay. So now there is... Uh... Can a gynecologist be attached to more than one IVF clinic? I think yes, there is no such restriction. Same with embryologist, I feel they can be attached an andrologist yes. with yes. any number of clinic. Yes. But then, what so my, about... so my understanding here is yes, one can get attached to many, but at least the clinic should have one at least full time uh, gynecologist, dedicated full time gynecologist. It should not happen that the clinic is having separate various visiting gynecologists and no one full-time gynecologist. Where I believe the authorities would have a problem. Okay. So that is one more issue. And uh, same thing about, uh, regarding the oocyte stimulation for uh, uh, IVF. A patient on, is this, on this issue of known semen donation, if you go to Form 15, that already has a line that I understand I have no rights whatsoever on the resulting offspring. Yes. It so is it's there. actually a part of the consent. But if consent. you take an additional letter again, I mean, it's an added precaution, that's all. But th that is always there, that I have no right over this baby. And uh, that is one issue that's uh, happening. So I think with that, I don't have any further questions for all of you. But if you, on your own, would want to put some comments on the opportunities, challenges, and how this can be app applied very, uh, what I would say, uh, legally safe way for all the IVF practitioners would be important. So, any comments from the panelists? Any registry has been started and the, uh, like PNDT, are we supplying data, uh, uh, submitting data on the next, uh, anywhere in the country? Any idea? So far, national National it has not started. Online it has not started. Dr. Manish, you would... So I would only say one point. I think there have been a lot of judgments coming from various courts allowing certain procedures to be done. I think we should not take this as an amendment in the law. This is a specific approval for that specific case only. And no one should generalize it and use it for their patients. It is because in a lot of groups, there are discussions that now this is allowed, this is not allowed. I think all the judgments are related to that particular case. And if you see, most judgments have allowed things to do because the treatment had started before the law came into force. They have not, I, I don't think the courts will be able to modify the law. So, but still, I mean, don't get carried away with what you read on uh, WhatsApp groups or by isolated judgments. I think we should still, whatever is written in the law is final. Agree. So, my... Uh... 
to uh, send to the uh, public is basically uh, whenever the case that you are handling uh, apart from the medical history if the case has any other history of a previously consulting doctor or any other history which may turn around to be a legal point uh, while you are taking the brief from the patient please note down that is also a very important aspect and part of your prescription or note down uh, diary of a case and um, consents uh, to be signed properly by the patient to be explained by uh, to them in their uh, vernacular language uh, so these are the very important aspects your documentation and discharge summary as is being told so these are very important aspect when uh, the file is properly uh, taken care of then the case is usually you know on on the right track and uh, as uh, a safer thing for a doctor so as far as my credit goes like uh, the at the time of registration when we are starting the procedure the age of the male and the female should be considered. So this particular case where the husband has just completed 55, two months back the egg retrieval was done, first transfer failed. I am still eligible to transfer those embryos in the wife because the husband is now 55 and the wife is waiting for the embryo transfer. I don't what? think so. I don't think so. I think the law specifies the age on the day of embryo transfer. So maybe on the day of embryo transfer or on the day of registration. Embryo, the day of the procedure. Otherwise, so you can you can register a patient today and carry out the treatment after five years. No, but they should give some time period after the pickups. Like this I couple hurriedly did it because it was. Age, I think the age on the day of the transfer is what matters. So I think they we have to explain that if you cross that date, we will not be able to do it. Or they. Can can go to court and get the permission. Yes, like courts, may not, courts may not see this favorably, you know, because this is something which could have been anticipated and prevented. Look, the couple can decide whatever they want. So, so I think if it goes by this, let's say the patient completes 50 years on 1st of January, I can do a pickup on 28th of December and then transfer on 2nd of January. I, I should not have six done that pickup. Time, no? six, six months time should be given. No, the first transfer failed. But it First is not transfer in the law. Paid, but, but she has but, got still embryos with her. But the law law does not provide for this. So if the court gives an approval, yes, but we cannot do it without any approval. What do you think, Radhika? Will this case not be favorable in the law of court? Uh well, the larger goal is that, ma'am, that we have to touch upon the technicality of the act and uh, already if they are starting on late and one attempt failed, they have few embryos lined up. Uh, in that particular case, the answer is 50-50%. It go this way or that way. The larger part is to uh, talk about that the rule which has been passed by the government is um, ultra wires the fundamental rights as well as the surrogacy regulation act. The moment we are able to convince the government on that, uh, a lot of things will uh, fall in place. Age criteria, I don't think so, would be very, very much favorable in the patient's uh, thing because at the end of the day, longevity is a big thing, which, you know, comes to the mind of the court also while allowing these procedures. Because child consideration, child welfare rights very, very high on the mind of the court is that I have seen. But uh, yes, uh, if the patient uh, feels the need and uh, is ready to understand that it go, can go this way or that way, then uh, no harm they taking a chance. Yeah, yeah, no harm taking a chance, yes. Unless or until, I also believe the fact, now on the other side, I believe the fact, if you will not fight for your rights, nothing will going to happen. You know, uh, there is a patient uh, and I really, really appreciate her a lot. Uh, she, uh, her surgically, her uterus is removed and uh, ovaries were also removed because she found it at a very uh, last stage when ovaries had to go. She is now fighting with it. She came to me just recently and I told her there is this notification. She said, I am going to fight it out. I will fight it out no matter how long it is going to take. So I believe that, you know, if you have... Uh, uh, this is an issue. In Karnataka, three patients with egg donation surrogacy were given permission, like in Supreme Court. And one couple with M the wife has MRKH and they had first baby through surrogacy. And they have their frozen embryos from the first cycle. 
they went to court and the court gave a permission for second surrogacy. So it is the high court's judgment by which we go or what do we decide? High court's judgment are equally applicable unless no, until so it is challenged. Right, so couple is going for surrogacy for the second baby in Karnataka. Yes, we okay, can so use it. Now, now what happens is school. high court. So, uh, so a similar kind of case, uh, if happens in a, in a state of Karnataka, that ruling will be very helpful. Now, state of Gujarat, uh, judges have the same mind of a high court of Karnataka can differentiate. So it's not obligatory on the Gujarat high court or on the Delhi high court, you know, to take that. Now, few high courts are very, very respective high, respected high courts and uh, even the judges in Delhi, like Kerala high court. If a judgment comes from Kerala high court is given due respect and regard in Delhi also because some remarkable judgments have come from there. So, uh, but again, not obligatory. But if it has come from Supreme Court, then the entire high courts have to, you know, it's... Uh, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think with this, we wish everyone good luck to start practicing the ART as per the legal act. And we are waiting for the online registry also. And uh, hopefully there are so many gray areas which we have discussed today needs to be clarified. Yes, Dr. Sunil, you want to say something? Uh, are you taking all the consents in Gujarati, Manishbhai and Madam? There is no written that it has to be vernacular. We take in English only mostly. But we have Gujarati options. English or Hindi, because uh, that's okay, ne? Because yeah, yeah. Uh, Radhika said that uh, it has to be in vernacular language. Better, na, if you are, all the more, otherwise, no such need. But if the patient doesn't understand English or doesn't understand Hindi, specifically knows about the local language tomorrow, how will you say that this person has understood and has signed? So the situation becomes a little weaker in the court because at that point in time, you would say that, you know, uh, uh, we were trying, we communicated, the court will not understand you communicated everything, the patient understood everything because the patient can't even speak that particular language or understand that language. So when you are practicing in a particular state, at best now you have, you know, at least to get your consents converted in that uh, no, but language. if you are doing a hysterectomy, do you take consents in Gujarati if the patient does not understand English? See, courts are going, uh, Dr. Banker, in a very different way these days. You know, there is a consumer court judgment which has said standardized consents we don't understand, you know. You need to have a consent where it shows that you have given a personal attention to the patient, you know, explained everything in your ways. So, at least, you know, whatever uh, consents you are getting it signed in your state, you know, you should get converted uh, in that particular language also. Even if that is mandate of law or not a mandate of law, at the end of the day, it's a small little job which helps uh, a long way to establish a good clinical practice. Because how will you say it is an informed consent? You know, it is a consent. Informed consent includes the language the person understands. I think with this, we conclude and we hand it over to BSV and uh, with the aim of practicing it legally and being it in line in few months to a year. Thank you. And I hand it over to you, Pratmesh. Madam Monday, you, ma of uh, BSV, we request Pratmesh to please give the vote of thanks. And uh, we would like to inform that we have 732 people who are currently live and watching this. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nana, yeah. ma'am. Thank you, Sunil. Manish sir, uh, thank you, uh, Radhika ma'am. It was very nice discussion and the good insights were shared and good insights were discussed. Okay, how to solve the cases and how to, what situations in a day-to-day -day life the doctors are facing and how to tackle the situations. Thank you ma'am. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you doctors. Thank you so much.